Shalom Aleichem. We're going to start, we're going to continue with Hashem this class that we've taken a big break because of the Chagim. Oh, Hashem, what an amazing month of Chagim. And we are ready to go back to, to the regular schedule. We're going to continue studying the Chatzai Yosef. We are in chapter 9, page 97, is where we left off, I believe. I'm just going to read the, the Gemara again just to uh, resituate ourselves, to remind ourselves of what we're talking about. Again, I was speaking about Zeh Gitin, that Nun Vav Amud Aleph Bet, talking about the famous story of Abba Sikri and Banyo Kana Mezakai. The Gemara says, it's on page 93 over here. Abba Sikri was the leader of the Zelots, by your name, of, Yerush, um, of Yerushalayim. He was the son of the sister of Banyo Kana Mezakai, the nephew, pretty much. Who was the leader, the spiritual leader of the time in Yerushalayim? We're going to remember, remember that the Yerushalayim is being sieged. It's in the middle of a siege. It's surrounded by the Romans. They're being starved out from, for already three years. And all of their uh, provisions, all their wheat and everything is burned up. <coughs> so they're trying to arrange a secret meeting between each other. He said to him, Come to me in secret. He came. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zagai said to him, to Abba Sikra, his nephew, Until when will you do, continue to do this and kill everyone through starvation? Abba Sikra said to him, What can I do? For if I say something to them, who's them? His, his other people, his other uh, <coughs> members of his group, the, the Zalats, the Bayonim, who are running everything inside Yerushalayim. If I say anything to them, they will kill me. Because they have in their mind, they want to go to the war with the Romans. Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakai said to him, prepare for me a method so that I can come out of the city. It is possible that I can arrange some small salvation. Right? So Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakai wanted to negotiate <coughs> with the Romans. Abba Sikra said to him, pretend to be sick and have everyone come, come and ask about your welfare as if you are on the brink of death and bring something rotten like a dead carcass, dead animal, place it near you so that they will think you have died and then your students... Then the, 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 the language is Bali Ayinu Bach Tamidach. Then your students will enter to you, let them enter to your quarters where, being, where you are, to bring you to burial, and let no one else come in so that they do not notice that you are still light. Since they know that a living person is lighter than a dead person. So we spoke about that, the whole depth and significance of all that, all those details, in the previous Shiwurim uh, on this chapter, chapter 9. Okay. <clears throat> I think we called it The Show Must Go On. So if you look at the part one and two over there, you should see it. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai did so. He did the whole plan, pretended to be dead, and they put him in the box, in the casket to take him out. Who came to him specifically? Which students? Rabbi Ezer entered to him from the one side and Rabbi Yoshua from the other side. Those were his two top students. <clears throat> they came, one from one side, one from the other. When they arrived at the entrance of the city, from the inside, the guards who were, the, the Baryonim, the Zealot guards, they wanted to stab him. They wanted to check if he was really dead. Abba Sikra said to them, like the leader, their leader said to them, who was also the nephew of Abba Yechonah Zakai, they will say they stabbed their rabbi. The guards didn't want to push Abba Yechonah Zakai's body. Abba Sikra said to them, they will say they pushed their rabbi. It's going to be a bad look, don't do it. Okay. They opened the now, gate and he was taken out. So Abba Yechonah Zakai was able to come out of Yerushalayim. Yeah, to speak with the Romans, and that's going to be the chapter, the subject of the next oh, section. Okay, okay. But right now, we have to answer a very, very important should, question. I hope to finish this part of the Chazayu Sef in the next thirty minutes, less than thirty minutes. Really the <clears throat> a serious question we asked was, why does the Gemara give him the, the, uh, the detail? There was a Yoshua and a Bilei Ezra specifically who came in, one from one side, one from the other side, to carry out Rabbi Yehuda and the guys, presumably a dead body. Why does that detail matter? Every detail in the Gemara comes to teach you something. We're trying to investigate and dig why that detail right now. And on page 97, we're going to talk about it. Let us dig further. It says here, second paragraph. <clears throat> Aaron Gemara makes mention that Rabbi Yehuda came in to carry Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai's body from one side and Rabbi Yoshua from the other. In order to understand the significance of this detail, we must introduce the following Gemara in Masechet Rosh Hashanah, Yud Amut Bet. 10b going into 11a over there, a very famous, famous cryptic Gemara. The Gemara says as, as follows: We're going to translate. We translate in English. Page 97 says the following: It was told of Brayta that Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Eliezer from Rashi, he says 
His opinion is, his position is. In Tishrei, the world was created. The month of Tishrei. The month that we're in now. The, month, the world was created in Tishrei, according to Rabbi In Nisan, the Jewish people were redeemed from Egypt. Right? That's pretty simple. But in Tishrei, the Jewish people will be redeemed in the future. He says also, in the final redemption, Rabbi Yezus is of the opinion that in the future, <coughs> It's going to be Tishrei, when, uh, which is going to be the month of the final yeah, yeah. salvation of the whole climax of all history. history. That's his opinion. Rabbi Yoshua says, however, Rabbi Yoshua, that was his rival. They always disagreed. The way they disagree, the Gemara says that says they're 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 machlokit. They're ugly. Rabbi Yoshua was the other person who carried uh, a bind of the guy's body out. He says that really in the sun the world was created. Those also, he says, in Nisan, the Jewish people were redeemed from Egypt. So they agree in that. The Yeshua and Rabbi that agree that in Nisan was the exit when the Jews were taken out of Egypt. Where do they disagree? They disagree in when the world was created. <coughs> and not only that, but also when the future salvation is going to be. And in Nisan, the Jewish people will be redeemed in the future in the final redemption. That's Rabbi Yeshua's position. So Rabbi Yeshua holds that uh, everything is in Nisan, pretty much, to record Rabbi Yeshua. Nisan, the world was created. Nisan uh, is going to be first, uh, the one Mashiach yeah, comes. And Rabbi Yisrael says, no. In Tishrei, the world was created. And Tishrei is going to be one Mashiach comes. Again, these are two monumental months in the Jewish calendar. These are two months where we have the most basic, uh, some of the most fundamental holidays, first of all. Sukkot, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur is on Tishrei. Pesach is in Nisan. They're six months apart. They are both the transitional times of the year, spring and autumn. <clears throat> this is one of the most fundamental disagreements in the Talmud. Yeah. And it is shared between none other than the two rabbis that carried yeah, Rabbi Yochanan yeah. Benzakai's body out of Yerushalayim, Rabbi Ezer and Rabbi Yoshua. Explanations, interpretations, and settlements of this argument have flooded the study hall. And its books for centuries. A lot of has been written about this. Much ink has been put to paper regarding this topic. But our goal here is simply to extract the answer to our question. The deeper wisdom upholds that both opinions of Rabbi Ezer and Rabbi Yoshua are true. Okay, so look at the note number seven about the source over there. The Shnei Chotabri, very important source. The deeper wisdom, the old source over there. He goes on to explain how they're both true. And it's a shared opinion that they're both true. How can it be both true? How can the world be created in Tishrei and in Nisan? You know it's perfect. Hashem made it run perfectly. He runs everything perfectly. You understand what I'm saying? Because right now, we just finished the Torah, Mezut Baraka, yesterday. And we just started reading Bereshit, the creation of the world. And this week's parasha is going to be Bereshit. And now we're talking about the creation of the world. So Hashem is just a master conductor. He really is. So this could uh, I could write a video, you know, but I should be Rashid also. People will click on it too. You know, I don't have to put the answer. But it's okay, we'll be honest. So it says further. <clears throat> They're both true. How? Meaning the world was created in a certain aspect in Tishrei. And it was also created in a certain aspect in Nisan. We're getting into a little bit of an abstract idea here. It's a very basic fundamental principle in the deep words in Kabbalah. I'll do my best to explain it. Creation was constructed. All of creation was constructed based on certain principles that govern all processes within it. God made rules and processes that run throughout the whole creation. One of these principles is something called Sof Ma'asev Mahshabat Tehila. The end result Action was in thought at first. In other words, thought come first, thoughts come first, and the thought gets transferred into a revealed action. Okay? This is actually one of the lines in the Lechadodi. Sof ma seb mashavate haila, right? Lechadodi. Very famous uh, poem that we sing every Friday night. Written by Rabbi Shlomo Halevi Alkabet, who was the rabbi of the <coughs> rabbi of the Ariya Kadosh. So, meaning, <coughs> before anything manifests in the revealed world, a seed, often intangible in nature, it's intangible, like a thought, you can't touch it, you can't feel it, but you know it had to be there, right? For anything to exist, for this book, for this camera, for you and me, for anything to exist, for this, you know, food that you're eating here, someone had to have an idea, I want to make something. 
I want to create it. I want it's going to be simple like this. It's going to taste like this. It's going to look like this. It's going to talk about this. And then they take the steps to make it. That's the process. That's the basic capitalistic process of the ten sefirot. The upper three is called thought. Thought. The upper three sefirot, where you think, is where even God, uh, quote unquote, thinks. Right? The deeper sources always use this term. That Allah b'makshabat. It came up into the thought realm of God. What does that mean? That means that in the process of anything become real, God made it to that first. It's in the thought realm. It's an intangible idea state, and then only it gets revealed into. Or could actualize. get revealed into actualization. actualization. Okay. <clears throat> Meaning, before anything manifests in the real world, a seed of an intangible nature is planted first. Something of what one might call a thought, a plan, or a code. Okay. In Tishrei, the month of Tishrei, this intangible aspect of the world was created first. This thought, seed like world. But then in Nisan, six months later, points. The revealed universe, as we see it and feel it and measure it and hear it, in all its glory, was manifest. In keeping with this model, the Maharal, in his Kedushay Agot and Rosh Hashanah over there, he explains, he metaphorically compares Tishrei to the head of the process, while Nisan is the heart of the process. The head is where the process cognitively develops the potential energy stage, if you will, while the heart represents life beating, actualization of the potential, the kinetic implementation of revealed existence taking its intended form. In terms of the ten sefirot which govern all existence, the top three, like we just said, we'll say it again, the top three sefirot of Kete of Mabina are in the realm of thought, the realm of Tishrei, that's Tishrei. While the lower seven sefirot, from Chesed down to Malchut, they are in the realm of physical reality, the realm of Nisan. You know how everyone is saying now how they go further and further, they're like from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, it's it, it's sealed, you can't do no more. Actually from Yom Kippur to Rosh Hashanah, to, to Rosh Hashanah no, actually the 12 days after Simchat Torah are representative of the 12 months. It's all a system, it's, so it's, it's, it's a spiral. But I, based on what you're teaching here, I would say, you know how, so I think in Two parshas before Vizot the Brach, I forgot the name of the parsha. Yeah. Uh, uh, Zino, I think the song mm-hmm. one, yeah, where, where Moshe says Hashem's Brach will will um, come over you and then overtake you, or it's it'll 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 come to you and then overtake you. So it's like what what's the what's the whole thing? So it's like that was not Zino. You know, when he said Gucha, something else. This is that's in the curses and blessings. Oh, I think that's it. Yeah, so it will come to you and it'll and it'll, and it'll run after you. And it'll it'll, 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 it'll overtake grab you. you. So what, so what are they saying? Is same thing like when you when you pray for something on Rosh Hashanah, they say like to, for it to get sealed for it to here right. it's it's here. You, you brought it down, catch. but now you now you gotta actualize it. Sure. Hashem was like, sure. yeah, you'll get this million sure. dollars this year, but it's like now you gotta actualize. You gotta make it, it happen. You're right. Same idea. This idea runs everywhere. You'll find it everywhere. That's the beauty <clears> of the deeper wisdom because you find the rules and the formulas that actually come up come about everywhere. If you know the rules of the system, you can figure out everything, all the, all the details. You don't need details. Like the same thing in science. They're doing their best, all these scientists, to to uh, to, to discover formulas. Once they hide the form, once you have the formula, you can use that to figure out any other detail later. That's the beauty of that. Same thing in Torah. So look over here. The influence of the ten sefirot originates at the top. At the, at the first one on top and propagates downwards in order. Right? <coughs> so if you want to see the picture, it's on page 527. We put it over there. It's very important to look at. In the same way, the day of Rosh Hashanah, which just passed, right? Which is the first day of Tishrei, is the day of judgment when major factors are determined for the rest of the year in a, on a micro and macro scale. That means individual pe- people's lives and the country's, you know, life, so to speak. Whatever's going to happen to the country, the history at large, was also decided on Rosh Hashanah. Okay. Nisan yeah. is the month defined by the attribute of Chesed, however. Nisan is all about Chesed. Where miracles occurred beyond belief okay, and beyond what was deserved. Right? Chesed is the first of the of the of the lower seven sefirot. We explained before how Chesed means unconditional giving, even though you don't deserve it. That's what happened to the Jewish people in the month of Nisan, all those American amazing miracles and being redeemed from Egypt and the spring of the sea didn't necessarily deserve that. Because they were also worshipping idols. It was all chesed by God. Right? That's what it sounds all about chesed. 
And Chesed is the first of the lower seven sefirot, the first of physical reality. The lower seven starts from Chesed, down to Malchut. Thus, the depth of the argument between Rabbi Ezer and Rabbi Yoshua is much more profound than we ever thought. Because Rabbi Ezer is saying, it happened in Tishrei, he's talking about the upper three, in thought. Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Yoshua, he said, the world was created in, in Nisan. <laughs> I remember why I said what I said. Yeah. Because <laughs> I read ahead. In Nisan. So he's talking about physical reality and creation. They argue about which aspect of creation is, more, is the more significant beginning. Is it the abstract seed that started it all in Tishrei? That's what really is his position. Or is it the actualization of real life in Nisan? That's Rabbi Yoshua's position. In a sense, they're not arguing about when it was created. Yeah. Talking about which one was the real creation, which one should we count as the real creation, where everything. What's more important? That's what they're arguing about. And really, you can defend both sides because you need both. Without a thought, you never have an action. Without an action, you never have anything real. So they're both important. It's like the famous car situation. What's more important, the wheels or the engine? Well, without either one, you can't move. Right. Based on this, it is only fitting that these two rabbis, Rabbi right. Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua. Who are arguing about the creation of the universe in thought and in actuality? That they should carry a banikhan and zakai between them. The Bili Ezra represents the inner realm of Tishrei. That's his position. Well, Rabbi Yoshua represents the outer realm of Nisan. That's his position. And Rabbi Yoshua and Zakai, the greatest Torah authority of the time, is held between them. He's the bridge between them. They're both holding them, right? One from one side, one from the other. Meaning he is the mouthpiece through which the Torah is siphoned, pulled out. You, you, you hear me? From the inner hidden realms into the daily lives of the revealing, of, of, the, uh, of the revealed living realm of the people. Yeah, Right? If the greatest Chachma that a person needs for Torah, it's the Chachma. Note 11 and 12 are important notes. Um, this is the Chachma. Side notes, but they're important. Let's just keep going for now. So, Rabbi Yechav is a guy, he's the medium through which Torah is transfused. You understand? Not only in his era, but also for future generations onwards, all the way until the final act of history. Since if it were not for him, for Rabbi Yechav as a guy, as we shall see in the next section, if it wasn't for him finding a way to escape that doomed city of Yerushalayim by way of this very whole concoction, this scheme that he had, this event, described by Gemara, then present-day Judaism would have looked very different. As the subsequent sections in our chapter were revealed. We're going to see that he actually he's going to be able to speak to the Roman general and he saved the Chachamim's lives. He's, 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 he spared them, as we'll see. To convey this message more vividly, or Ban Yochanan ben Zakai, representing the legacy of Torah, the legacy put, put forth by, by Abraham Avinu millennia prior, which was spoken about at length in the previous uh, lecture about talking about how Abayi Hamad's guy was continuing the mission of Abraham. His presumed death upon leaving Yerushalayim only to spring back into life outside of the walls of the uh, walls of the city. Right, that's what's going to happen. He's not, he didn't really die. As we should see in the next uh, following chapter, even though Torah seems dead for a moment, its heritage will never die. That's the point. To say that the imagery is heartening here would be an understatement, which means it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing here. It's being carried out through the hidden realm and the revealed realm. That's what it is in Rabbi Yeshua. He looks like he's dead. Torah looks like it's dead for a second. But when he comes out, he springs back to life and he saved the whole world. He saved Judaism. Finally, regarding the difficulty with Rashi, we have to mention that. Before we get there, um, Let's read, note, let's read note 11 and 12 quickly here, and then we're going to read the last piece on how to settle the Rashi on the, on the Gemara, and that's going to be it. Note 11. So, nevertheless, regarding the opinions of Rabbi Yez and Rabbi Yeshua, both opinions agree that both aspects are legitimate, right? That both are real. Both are real things. It was a thought realm and a real thing. In fact, the Gemara Rosh Hashanah 12a concludes that we count according to both counts. We actually use both counts. The Nisan count, as if the world was created in Nisan, and also as if the world was created in Tishrei. We count the history of generations of people from the creation of Adam, meaning the years, right? Right now, we just started from the year 5783. We count that from when? From Tishrei. That's when Adam was created. Adam was created in the first Tishrei. But we count the age of the celestial bodies, meaning the sun and the moon, 
which have big halakhic ramifications regarding the sanctification of the new moon, right? We say we say uh, the bracha on the moon every month. We also say a bracha on the sun once every 28 years when it goes back to the place where it was first created on Wednesday. Very interesting stuff. When do we count that? When do we make that bracha on the, on the sun? So once saying. every 28 years? Yeah. In Nisan. Also, in Nisan, not in Chapter is serious stuff. Yes. Yes. Serious, serious stuff. stuff. Good. So, uh, no 12. In the same vein, in Bible Metzia 59b, ooh, oh my goodness, that's such a famous, famous fundamental Gemara to understand for any Jewish person, they have to know this Gemara. In Bible Metzia 59b, I think you heard about this one before. Where it's uh, Rabbi Yezir and Rabbi Yoshua again having a very big argument. Another absolutely epic disagreement regarding the proper way to rule in halakha. Really, it was, it, was, it was talking about the oven, the status of an oven, whether it's tamer or not, but it was much deeper than that because they, got, they, could, they disagreed. Here, I think I summarized it here. They were arguing regarding this, the halakhic status of a certain oven, and Rabbi Ezer called upon miracles, miraculous events, many amazing or miraculous events to occur if his opinion was correct because they wouldn't accept his opinion. And he said, you know, if I'm right, let the tree start walking. If I'm right, let the river reverse. The same river that's been for millions, of, you know, not millions, but thousands of years, it's running one way, so let it reverse. If I'm right, let the, the, the walls of the yeshiva come down. If I'm right, let, let the voice from heaven come out and say that I'm right. And all those things happen. Everything happened. But Rabbi Yeshua stood on his ground and disagreed. Why? Indeed, the miracles occurred, and even a heavenly voice proclaimed that Rabbi Yehuda was correct. You have to look at what the heavenly voice no, said. It was very specific what it said. It didn't say the halakha is like him. It said, why are you arguing with Rabbi Eliezer? Don't you know every time he's ar- he argues, he is, he's, he's clear of his argument? Meaning, that was also part of the test. Because even though it said that, they weren't supposed to listen to the heavenly voice. The heavenly voice didn't say, halakha is Rabbi Eliezer. didn't say that. It said, why are you arguing with him? It's all part of the test. For Yosh- who? The rabbis? For the other side, who was the correct side, Rabbi Yoshua. Because here, look what he says. Rabbi Yoshua was, uh, it was the, he was the majority. There was a majority of rabbis, and Rabbi Yoshua was the leader of them. Rabbi Yoshua, however, led the majority opinion of the rabbis, who disagreed with Rabbi Yezir, and they were not impressed a bit by the miracles. They kept saying, we don't take halachic proofs from uh, miracles, my friend. They mm. weren't faced. They weren't faced. He stood firm, Rabbi Yoshua stood firm on the Torah principle. The Torah says itself, sway after the majority. Achrei Rabbim lehatot. And that's what the Torah wanted them to do. That's what Hashem wanted them to do. And the Torah is not in heaven. Another famous verse from the end of uh, Parashat Vayelich. Meaning the Torah itself dictates that the majority of authoritative opinion of the sages decides the law. Despite what a heavenly voice may proclaim. Meaning God gave the keys of the creation. The keys of deciding law to the power of, in the hands of the honest Chachamim. That's what it is. Whatever they rule, majority rules. That's what it is. And it's a very, very famous story over there. You have to look over there. But just, I wanted to show you another, uh, you know, example of their, their argument. The Rabbi and Rabbi Yeshua. This contrast in opinions between Rabbi and Rabbi Yeshua represented another transitional shift in history. You have to look at Rabbi Tat's book, As Dawn Ends the Night, pages fifty-six to fifty-nine, talks about that. The root of their disagreement accords with the with their disagreement in Rosh Hashanah here, though. The root of that disagreement about whether or not you're going to take miracles to rule halakha, it's the same disagreement in Rosh Hashanah, or Masech Rosh Hashanah, about when the world is created, Tishrei or Nisan. The root is the same. Why? Rabbi Eliezer maintains that the truth of the hidden world takes precedence in the same halakha. Rabbi Eliezer is all about the hidden world. It's all about the upper three, right? He said that the world is created in Tishrei, that's the most important one. So therefore, miracles. Right? Well, Rabbi Yeshua maintains that it is the opinion of those present in the revealed world who take precedence. Like he said, the, the, same Torah, the Torah is not in heaven. Yes, that was the right thing. That was the right thing. Right. <sighs> okay. So now, we have to uh, address the issue with Rashi. What did Rashi say? What was the issue with Rashi? Mm. So at the end of our Gemara, when... They brought the body, presumed dead, presumed, presumably dead body, to the gates of the uh, city from the inside. They wanted to leave the court, uh, wanted to leave the gates. The gates, the guards over there wanted to stab the body, see if it's really dead. And Abbasikwa told them, don't do it, because if you do it, they will say that they stabbed the rabbi. Who's the they? Who's going to say that they stabbed the rabbi? Rashi said, He's talking about the Romans. I mean, the Romans on the outside, they're going to see 
if they stabbed his body or they disrespected the body, and that's not right, that's not good. It's not, it's not a bad look that they're, you know, for their own leader, they're stabbing. The Rashi said that they is the Romans. This is a little bit of a problem because maybe the Romans might see, if they stabbed him, they might see holes in the body. But what about the second thing in the Gemara, where they said, okay, they wanted to push him, they wanted to feel him. How will the Romans see that? Okay, fine. If they touch them and then they uh, brought his body out, how would the Romans ever see that they touched them and moved them around? You know, that's the problem. It doesn't, doesn't make sense to us. Let's read the last paragraph here. We're on page 98. Finally, regarding the difficulty with Rashi, the Ben Yehuda, he rejected Rashi's explanation. He rejected it. He said, when Rashi said the they means the Romans, right? He disagreed. Instead, the Ben Yehuda said that, instead suggested, that the they means the other zealots. You see, the other, the other by your name would see that, and they, you know, they, they still had respect for their rabbis. They, you know, they weren't like, you know, not, you know, evil people. They just wanted to fight the Romans, but they still had respect for the rabbis. And therefore, if they heard that somebody at the gate disrespected the rabbi, they would have been uh, upset about that. That's a Ben Yehuda explains. However, Rashi is of the historical class of the Rishonim. He's earlier. And the rules of engagement in Torah study are very important. What are they? They are that in order for an authority from the Achronim, which is the later historical class of authority, such as the Ben Yehuda, which is the Ben Yehuda, in order for him to disagree with the Rishon, such as Rashi, which is before him, there needs to be support for the disagreement from another Rishon. I Meaning you can't just outright disagree with Rashi. Who are you going to disagree with Rashi? He's in a pre- previous class. If you want to disagree with him, you have to find another rabbi in his generation, <clears throat> Tosfot, Ritba, Rambam, others, many others, as support for your position against them. Right? So in note 13, uh, we explain more about this rule. This is a steadfast axiom, which means it's a straight out law, rule they have to follow in Halakha. But when it comes to Agadah, however, which is what we're learning now, stories in Gemara, there's a lot more leeway, because you're not really changing the Halakha if you disagree with the Rabbi, if you disagree with the Rishon. So that's why I like the Binyan Gadah to disagree with him. Right, which is why we, this is why we find sometimes commentators of the era of the Achronim, later era, disagreeing with the Rashi's explanation of, the, of, of an Agadah. But still, we want to try to hold up the rule. Right? We want to try to support Rashi here. Therefore, it is incumbent upon us, top of page 99, it's incumbent upon us to try to defend Rashi's position. Ironically, we can defend Rashi based on what the Ben Yoherda himself explained prior that normally the zealots themselves would carry out the bodies and bury them in the cemetery outside the city. Right? That's what they normally would do because they didn't trust anybody else to take out the bodies to bury them. But this time, they allowed a one-time exception, said the Ben Yehuda said himself, that they allowed a one-time exception for the students to carry out their, their, their rabbi's body as a respect to the rabbi. Thus, when our Gemara says they will say that they stab or push their rabbi, it means indeed that the Romans will say so. The meaning that they is the Romans, like Rashi said. We're defending Rashi. The they means the Romans. How? How would the Romans find out? From the students of the rabbi who would have witnessed the stabbing or the pushing, right? Because they, they were allowing the students to go bury him out, out of the city. So they would have saw this if they did it, if they allowed the people at the, guard, the guards to stab him or something. They would have saw, the students would have saw it, and whom the zealots were making an exception to let out, these accom- accompanying students could have then gone rogue to the Romans, right? They, they could have sold themselves, you know, and become, become informants, right? In the interest of their own survival, because they were hungry inside. Just as the Ben Yehoyda explained was their original concern for why the Zalat set up this rule that only they bury bodies in the first place. They would have then have informed the Romans about the Zalats, how the Zalats treated their rabbi's body if that happened. So basically... Just a technical uh, support of Rashid. We felt we had to do that. But nevertheless, uh, the main point of this chapter was to show you the depth of the creation of the universe, the, the, the fact that there, is a, there was a thought realm and a physical real realm, Nisan, Tishrei, and that that's the reason why the Gemara says these, specifically these two rabbis came to carry out Rabbi Yechim and Zakai because they were literally, the whole world was in their hands as they did it. So, Baruch Hashem, we're starting a new year. Uh, I'm also going to try to make a video this week about from a, for a bit of sheet right. with a new commentary this week, uh, this year. I'm going to try to do the Kliyakar, a very deep commentary. Uh, amazing commentary. But just the problem is that the holiday is the middle of the week and you have a couple of days left before Shabbat. I don't know if I'm going to make it, but with Hashem's help, we're going to have a very, very successful year in Torah learning and everything else. Wow. Baruch Hashem,
Amen, amen. Next week we're going to start section 2, Bezat Hashem, page 99.